Suara Inspirasi Where every voice tells a story And every story will inspire you Alright That silence was a bit long Yeah For guys who can't stop talking You know <laughs> uh, Anyway, happy morning uh, Good morning Good morning, good morning. This is quite a treat, actually. I mean, and, and thanks to Audi. Let's talk about the car first. I love this sure. car, man. <laughs> we are driving an e-tron GT. Well, I think one of the first few in the country at the moment. Awesome car so far. Fully electric, right? Yeah, fully electric. It's the e-tron. Saving the environment and having a, a, a nice chat at the same time. <laughs> so let's get on with it. Right. So, Jung Lin, thanks for joining us. So... As usual, in our sessions, we want to make it as casual as possible because yep. we want you to be comfortable enough to share with everybody who's listening to us your journey into becoming who you are today. Because everybody knows Nando in Malaysia. I don't think... <laughs> well, Malaysia, Singapore, some say Batam, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's I a think, household name. It's a household name. Right? I think you'd be actually surprised how many people still don't know Nando's. Are you But this is an opportunity, right, to grow. Okay, so, so let's, 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 let's catch up in terms of what have you been doing in the past... In the new quarter, right? Chung Lin, what how's, how's Nando's been, been doing over the past? You know, I, I was telling Chung Lin earlier, you know, I wanted to eat, uh, you know, I love Nando's, but I must have coleslaw. So I'm going to highlight this. Okay. Chung Lin, so why no coleslaw now? Okay, no, no, no. Actually, we do have coleslaw, but uh, my standards are quite high and yeah. um, we, we, we want a certain standard in the coleslaw dressing. So at the moment, I think the one that you went to actually probably just had an issue, but... Um, um, we're we're in the midst of changing our coleslaw dressing. There basically. you go. So, and I like how Chun is particular about this. And I like when we go into the the, the depth of how Chun Lin built Nando's into a, a household name, as you mentioned, Chun Correct. Is the fact that quite a lot of the menu stuff, mm -hmm. Chun Lin had a hand in it. So in the, the early days, yeah, nowadays the early days. not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, we want to go into that. Um, I want to know a few things, right? So you were in the UK when you first heard about the brand Nando's, right? What year was it when you first stumbled upon that brand? Okay, so um, we started the business in 1998. I think wow. I got to London after finishing my university around 95, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, I, I was working as an architect in those days, right? So I graduated... Um, and it was the peak of recession there. So I've never told you my story about how I got a job in the UK. No, no, no. no okay, so, so peak of recession, there was no jobs. And in those days, you wrote physical letters. Okay. I sent out 50 letters. Five um, zero. Uh, five zero. Oh, okay. With a Kit Kat, two bar Kit Kat on every <laughs> single one. Wow. And on every single Kit Kat, I wrote a little sticker that said, give me a break. Wow. You remember those days there was that ad that was, wow. uh, yeah. have a Kit Kat, have a break, right? So I sent that out. I had so many replies. I got a job within like a month. So okay. I worked in one of the top commercial architectural practices over there. Got my RIBA. Um, and, and there was an Anders. Um, just behind where I lived in, in London. So whilst I was working, I used to go and eat this Nando's there. Okay, that's central London. No, it was in Putney. Okay, all right. My office was in central London, but um, where I lived was in Putney. Okay. Anyway, so um, what happened was my, my parents came to visit one, one of the holidays and I took them to eat Nando's. Okay. In those days, remember, right? Fast food was just your, your big brands and that was Correct. it. It was just American fried food, yeah. basically, or burgers. Yeah. And this Nando's had like spicy flavors. Um, it was just, you know, uh, it was just so different. It was grilled. And my dad fell in love with it, called the manager over and just mm -hmm. immediately said, right, where mm -hmm. do I get this? Within a month, he was flying over to South Africa. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then he called me up. I was still at work and he said, you know, how about you come back and run the business for me? And I was like, what? <laughs> I've just spent seven years to qualify. I just got my RIBA. I was a professional architect. And what did we know about chicken, right? Um, and I remember when I handed in my notice, I actually told someone from the practice that I was going to work for, for Nando's. And they were like, what? That funny <laughs> chicken chain? Um, but anyway, that was history. And that's basically how I, I came to start Nando's. Where was the first outlet that you launched Nando's in Malaysia? In Bangsa Telawi. In, oh, those, okay. in, those days, in, in those days, Bangsa Telawi was yeah. and happening. Yeah, yeah, so, is. you know, all the food players were there. Um, and so that's where we, we ended up. 
But what what happened was the change. The the whole environment of Bangsa really changed. And at one point, it it's um the rentals all went correct, up. Correct, correct, correct. Everybody and left. And what year was right? the first outlet? Ninety uh... eight. Ninety eight. Right. So that was before you moved to Bangsa Village. The Talan yes. one moved to. Oh, yes, wow. yes, 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 okay. yes. Bangsa Village was probably my tenth store or something like that. So you operated in Talawi for how many years before you shifted to? We probably operated only for three years Ooh, or so. Okay. Yeah. So then there was no Nando's in Bangsa because three years, and then you said your ten store was in the three years, or? Okay, maybe it was slightly longer than three years. I, I, no, we had a gap. We had a gap in in Bangsa for a while. Um, but but basically, what happened was we opened in Bangsa. It was fine, and then what happened was it. Gosh, those guys are hanging out in the car <laughs> in front of the police. <laughs> With the police, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, no, so so we opened quite fast. I think, you know, one of the things that happened with us was we 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 opened way too fast in the beginning, right? Okay. So people kept on asking us to open new sites and, you know, it was a glamour game, right? Opening new restaurants and having lots of restaurants. Everybody kept on competing against, oh, I've got 10 restaurants, oh, I've got 20 restaurants. And and I fell into that trap. Okay. So besides my first three restaurants were in quite strategic locations, I started expanding all over Kajang's, your, your Churras and all those kind of places. The suburban places. All yeah. the suburban places yeah. and people didn't know us. Um, so it was it was a, a real nightmare. Um, and, and that's how I got into cash flow issues in the early days. Okay, and during this time, I know, how did you actually navigate these uh, cash flow issues and also um, how do you plan your, your businesses to, to manage this? You know, this is quite a key, right? I mean, suddenly into this kind of crisis and, you know, expanding uh, at, at, at the kind of speed, right? So how Yeah, you... so, so those days we didn't have any analysis. It was go and visit a restaurant. If it, you, your gut feel tells you it should okay. be all right, it was fine. If you saw right. people there... Okay. Um, you thought it was fine, right? But what what I didn't realize was I was opening in places like Tesco's or okay. or you know like um, deepest darkest um, Kai Jung in those days, mm. and I just saw lots of people, but they were not our customers. The the early days, people really didn't know who Nando's was. Huh? Um, we were sort of mid income. Um, people were educated on fast food. Food was delivered fast. Um, and we were all cooked to order. So it was a lot of education in the early days about who Nandus was and what we stood for. Um, they didn't know the brand. It was, it was a lot of all this, lah, you know. So, so we opened too fast. And then what happened was you expect a certain amount of sales to come in. But the sales wasn't coming in. You had to pay your contractors and things like that. And that's where the cash flow crunch came in. Um, and I tell this quite often to all my mentees now. When you build a new restaurant, make sure you got enough for your operational expenses. Everyone always has enough to build a restaurant. Okay. Let's say they got so one million ringgit. that was ringgit. the guideline, I guess. In a way. Like, yeah, in a way, you always think that, right? I've got enough money to open a restaurant. They forget mm -hmm. that to run the restaurant after that or to run your business, you need operational cash flow. Yep, exactly. Right. Buy your stocks, pay your labor and all that. And that's the part where a lot of a lot of people get stuck. Anyway, we we after about a few years we had to um consolidate. We shut all these periphery restaurants. Oh. It, we we literally went back to just our core restaurants and that's nice. where we started. Um I was very lucky though because I had um we were we were a JV right Nando's is a JV between Nando's themselves and us okay and we had this international ops director and he was really really good he would come every three months okay he would sit me down and literally go through every single line so of the support PNL. was really there it was the not support just, was you were very, not just very left good. alone and you yeah. know go and handle yourself yeah. yeah okay so I was really good in that sense. He literally taught me how to read the PNL, every single line. What does it mean and all that? He taught me how to look for sites. He says, Chinglin, you need to stop looking at sites with your gut and that's it, right? You need to isolate all the duds um, if you can. Of course, you're never going to get it right every single time. But if you can isolate all those issues, um, at least you've got better chances of survival. So he started teaching me about how try and get as much um, insights into competitors' sales. And you can, yeah? You just ask anybody, you sure can get your sales of your competitors around that area. So we, by having those competitors' sales, we were able to judge. Let's say brand X, we were 30% okay. on average, always higher than them. All right. Brand Y, we were always 30% lower. So from that, whenever we go into a new place, we were able to gauge uh, forecasted sales. So that's okay. based on competitor sales. 
The so other, you're basically analyzing data at that time. Analyzing itself, right? data yeah. manually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then what the other thing we also did was we do physical counts. Okay. We literally hired students to go and sit in all the <laughs> outlets from 9 a.m. to like 10 p.m. for like one week. Wow. And then we did that for every single restaurant so we would know our drop in rate. Okay. Wow. Um, okay, that's, so, that's, 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 yeah, yeah. So basically, for every single person that walks past you, how many people come into your outlet? So that was our drop in rate and we had a trend. Okay. So now if we went into a, a new, we'll offer a new location, we would go and do our count and we'll say, oh, that one looks like a bangsa. That's the kind of customer profile, right? I so see. we'll say that one's okay. going to be a 10% drop-in rate. And so we would do that as well. And and that's how we got smarter and better at site analysis. I think when you launched Nando's back in the day, late 90s, right? That was the time that you've seen, you know, a change in terms of not just the Kopitiam movement because coffee bean launched in ninety late Correct. 90s as well. Yeah. All of Around a sudden, remember time. the price? 10 yeah, get yeah. for a oh, ice really, blender yeah, was insane. Yeah, that was insane. At, at that point of time, it was really kind of, yeah. you know... Um, People were shocked that you're paying yeah. these kind of prices. Yeah. But, and at the time when Nando's launched, I remember because I was I was probably in uh, university at the time. Like, <laughs> I loved the chicken, but as a uni student... It was expensive. It was expensive, right? Yes. Exactly. While you were fast food, you were not fast in the manner of, say, a McDonald's when they were just basically, you know, you go in, you go out, drive through, right? Right. But the quality is way different, right? How did you manage to... to reach that? Yeah, yeah. Reach, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, you so, mentioned, yeah. So, so uh, if you were in, in a food industry, you basically got fast food. Basically, everything is cooked. Um, pre-prepped, right? You go there, you go to the counter and the food's given to you straight away. There's then something called fast casual. Okay. And fast casual is basically food is cooked on order. Okay, okay. And at that time, um, we were the first. Um, nobody else knew about it. And then, of course, you've got your casual dining. Okay. The fast casual category in, in the world is probably the fastest growing category right now. Because okay. everyone's into fresh food and things like that, right? right. So they want food cooked to order. It's mm -hmm. healthier. And the pricing, of course, would then be slightly more. Okay. Because you now... Traditional fast casual, if you talk about them in the in the Western world, mm -hmm. you go to a counter, you order, and then the food is served to you. Okay. So UK was already running that concept, um, and they are probably our, our best country in the world. Mm -hmm. South Africa and Australia was running on more top-end fast food, so it was still go to the counter, order, um, and and it, the majority was takeaway. So they, they were more sort of top-end fast food. So about 10... 12 years ago, the group CEO decided that he was going to consolidate everyone around the world and give okay. us one, one, like, positioning. Direction. Okay. Because even in Nandas, Malaysia, we were table service for years, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so there were all these different ones. And, so, and um, the Middle East is still table service to this day. And oh, so okay. what they're trying to push is for us to be more uniform so that if you go to any Nandos around the world... It's the same. It's the same. And it makes sense, right? I mean, So basically, what... you, you enjoy the Nandos experience kind of stuff anywhere you go. And you know what to expect right. as well. Okay. And so the idea of the, the, the hosted cockroach... So we converted during um, COVID. It was quite timely, actually. Because, you know, people want, wanted less interaction with people. Um, and, and so we had the order at table and then we, we converted to hosted cockerel. But the thinking behind hosted cockerel was... Hosted also, co co So hosted cockerel is basically you come to the entrance, you meet a hostess. The okay. person sits you down and gives you a cockerel number. And then when you're ready, you go and order at the, at the counter. Okay. That's the traditional... Yeah. Hosted oh. cockerel, of which, course, which you did in Singapore before Malaysia, We did in right? Singapore. Yeah. So yes. I was, yeah. So I was there in Singapore. Say, I don't like this. I like to be served at the table. Typical I mean, Malaysian. You yeah. Know? Same. I, oh. I, I honestly had that experience with uh, with my partner and all that, and especially, um, they, they were in a way when beginning they were quite annoyed because nobody to serve, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because you got to line up, right? So yes. like in Singapore, in I think it was the Bras Basa one or, the, or somewhere near that. I forgot the name near that. Star Vista. Star Vista. Yes. Yeah. Star Vista. So I was like, I got to line up. I can't get my food until I pay. Yes. You know, so it was a weird change. But now, of course, you know. So so what, what happened then was order at your table and your device came on, right? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yes and yes, that yes. changed everything. So right. we got that ready in time for, for COVID. So we actually pivoted quite fast. Yeah. And we were able to meet this demand for less contact and everything else. But coming out of COVID, we are finding now that we maybe went too much that way and we lo lost that sort of touchy-feely part. We always knew through conversion that you would lose some of your older customers. And I agree we... to that, right? Because yes. um, uh, uh, this was my personal experience. At one time, I was with my family and also um, we had 
my mother-in-law and some old people. And we actually, we, we were quite hungry at that point of time. And we wanted an, an immediate service. And, and there we go, we got to scan and this, we, we just couldn't, you know, it's just taking too much of a time rather than we, because we already know what we want. Exactly. But then... Navigating that device is uh, a nightmare. Exactly. Yeah. And then asking. <laughs> so, uh, and we were wondering, and uh, at that point of time, we were just wondering, you know, how about people without devices? Or, uh, 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 it's, it probably is a small um, percentage of uh, older generation and how are you going to cope with that and all that kind of stuff? So you, you might lose that and people say, ah, is this yeah. too much for me? Exactly. And, yeah. So I, so, I, so what we realised was, um, and then we're getting that through all the qualitative feedbacks and things like that. We've done an analysis recently. Brand health trackers are telling us that. So we're, we're trying to go more hybrid. So, yeah. you know, there might be a, a um, one of our, our staff or what we call Nandokas walking around with a device that helps you order. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're trying to get to that right now. In the last three, four years, if we were a good table service um, restaurant, we've lost all that in the last three years, right? Or yeah. four years. So now you're having to like relook at that hospitality side and introduce that back to our people and retrain them. Um, and, and, and that's why just in the last three, four years, the amount of changes we've had has just been crazy. Okay. So now the hybrid is um, in effect again. That means you. We're have... trying to bring it in. So there might. I think we're in the midst of rolling that out now. So and... there might be a tablet that you know okay. one of our guys go around with. That makes sense. Yeah, I like that it because does. I think I think when yeah, you're true. talking about Nando's, it's an experience, right? It's an customer, experience, right? Yeah. You, you want to have the customers. Yeah. You want to have that touch. And yeah. and and do you? I I, I think. It, it's probably too early. Uh, you, you probably could gauge now that you have done that before and you stop and now you're going to start back, you could really s- probably see the difference as what's going to happen, right? Yeah. So, so it, I mean... Any feedback so far? Well, I mean, we're still in the sort of in the meet, midst of implementing. Okay. But, you know, the idea of, of this hosted cockroach, actually, it's quite good in the sense that you, the customer owns their journey. Yes. yes. So you go in, so if you do know our device and our app, it's, it's actually super fast, Correct. especially if you got Correct. your Correct. Apple Pay and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So it's actually easy to order through the, the app, right? Um, and then you, you want the sources, you go and help yourself, you want your drinks, you're going to help yourself and things. So, so you own your own experience. So that's, how do you marry that with the sort of, you know, customer service side and, and that touchy-feely side? And that's something that as a brand that's evolving all the time, you need to constantly think what's core to us, right? Nando's was really famous for our personality. Yep, that right. personal touch. The quirky and the, the cookie personal ads. touch, that personality and all that and bringing that in. I think it's just about, you know, um, trying to cater the various generation. I think it boils down to that, right? So, and and maybe the... Cu- the range of the customer customer's perspective of you know this generation and you rightly said you know quite a number of the younger generation prefer what you said you no know, go app this is is quite fast and you got to probably weigh that you know how much a number of percentage of that yes. is your client yeah and 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 you know the older generation is probably a smaller amount but that can be uh, uh, handled by the uh, the guy with the devices and all that and probably you know um, maybe have an option for all these guys and, you know, try to see. I mean, it's quite difficult to get 100%, you know, maybe a point where you're going to strike a balance to to uh, to manage that, I guess. I mean, the customer customer persona is simple, right? I haven't changed my order, Julian, since ever, yeah. right? Yes. I will change the, 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 the whether it's yours flaming chicken hot. Yours yeah, 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 but I know yours chicken yeah, livers. My chicken too. livers, my uh, sparkling apples. It's the same, no? Yeah. My sparkling apples, my chicken livers. My, it depends if I'm hungry, half a quarter chicken, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a specific type of whether I want, you know, flaming hot or just hot, right? And then the sides are going to be the same. Coleslaw, double coleslaw or coleslaw and peri chips, right? So the thing is, you can't beat me just going up to the guy and saying, I want this. Correct. I sit down, I know what I want, right? Same, yeah. same. It's, it's immediate, it's, right? It's for, for me, it's like half a chicken. I, 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 I always say I want two yeah. ties and no, not, not the yeah, one. Exactly, and, yeah. and everybody has that, but sometimes it's a bit difficult to customise. Correct. Yes. Uh, the, yes. So that's a challenge that we have. And if we can, I, I, I guess, I think you're already doing it now. You know, well, we're saying. trying, yeah. I mean, you know, one, one of the key things, you know, the... the our, our saying is basically everyone's welcome. Okay. But when you go into marketing, right, they have to go into a targeted correct, market correct, correct. because I when mean, they, they aim, right? So they're actually aiming for the youth. Yeah. Mm. So when they're talking, they're talking to the youth. It's it's us who are, we're, we're, we're aspiring to be the youth. We want to be uh, young. So, you're so actually right, forever young. We're, we're the <laughs> secondary market at yeah, the end of yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah true. Yeah, end of yeah. the day. Because uh, they're all it, constantly growing up, yeah, right? Yeah, it all, is, it is, it is yeah. the business. Like we were just talking about it just now, right? The younger generation, is the, the growth that we are looking at, how their thoughts, their thinking, you know, in the last three, 
years, four years. It's just crazy, right? Constantly changing. So like my daughter has been eating nando. She was like, what? She could eat solid food, right? Mm -hmm. And she will only eat the, the what do you call the it? The tenders. The tenders. Yeah. The okay. tenders. Still okay. today, the tenders, right? Okay. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, the, the tenders do so well. I mean, to me, I want my, my chicken on the bone. Yeah. But the yeah. amount of people who really like the tenders because yeah. it's so easy to eat. Yeah. Have you tried the one that, oh, what was that one? Oh, yeah. Ash potato. Yeah, 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 on yeah, yeah. I, I tried that. I tried that yeah, yeah. once. I'm like, wow. <laughs> this, is, this is a presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not potato. only the presentation. I think the, the, the taste and yeah. you, all, yeah. all the, all the juices. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The ash potato does really well in the Middle East. Oh, okay. They okay. they have ones that is as tall as the bridge. They, they got this one stand that's double our height. My God. And wow. it's got like double portion of, of um, chicken thighs. Wow. On there. And okay. they sell really well there. And that's the thing talking about food. I'm hungry, man. I'm same here. Especially Nando's because you know remember the taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My stomach is grumbling at the moment. <laughs> so moving back to the story of you being the accidental entrepreneur. Since yeah. you, you wanted to be you you were you were you were jet set about being an architect. Because again, being an architect isn't just like being in an arts degree in the sense where you have to go through so many different like part three and all this stuff. So you work and you really get that. Is you're a professional, Shung yeah. And before you could really, really do that portion of being a, a, a professional architect, you basically became an entrepreneur. Yes. So obviously the defining moment of being an entrepreneur is almost an accidental entrepreneur in the sense where your dad says, come back, run Nando's. When did you realize, hey, I actually am an entrepreneur now. I'm not working for my dad anymore. I'm doing something that I enjoy. And it's my own story. It is quite hard actually because I had that legacy of always being Mac's daughter, right? Yeah. So even though I started the business, I ran it, um, my dad didn't get involved in the day-to-day. Okay. -day. I was always Mac's daughter. And, and Honestly, that was my next question about it. <laughs> you're, you're answering it straight away. Okay, it, it, it was, you know, so... With the, the, the JV team, I think it took until about sort of 12 to 13 years. What? And Seriously? They, they, I, they worked with me. I was the main person. But, you know, whenever you met the shareholders and yeah. the owners, they would always be like, this is Max's daughter. It wasn't Chung Lin or whatever 13 it is. years, you know. Yeah, my God. yeah. Oh, but now, tough, but now it's, course, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, now yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, going through that for, for... That is a long period, right? Yeah. No, it is. So, so wow. I think the defining moment came when... Um, the group CEO, they finally appointed their first ever group CEO. Okay. So they were also an entrepreneurial company, right? Okay. Family and things like that. And they, they, you know, their friend did this and their friend did this and there were several shareholders. And then one day they decided that they needed continuity. How are we going to grow this brand to be a global brand? And they got their first ever group CEO. And this group CEO went around the world and decided the first thing he needed is to do was to assess every single CEO around the world and whether they were fit for purpose or not. So when they, in, when they did the analysis of me, so they, they got a third party professional assessor to come and interview all of us and I rated platinum. Wow. Amongst, uh, so I, I came out <laughs> amongst the top 2,000 CEOs in the world. I was at that kind of level. Wow. And, then, and that was when they, they suddenly thought, okay, Chung Lin is fit for purpose and, and she's Chung not Lin just... Chung Lin. Chung Lin is Chung Lin. Oh, no longer matches. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then by chance, um, at around that time as well, there was... Um, How many uh, years ago was this? Oh, okay. I think maybe 2013 or so. Maybe okay. 10, 11, 10 years, yeah. 12 years ago. Okay. Um, they, they also had like this competition on, on certain KPIs for all the sort of like, you know, franchise and JV partners. And we won business of the year. So it was like, yes, you know, so I... I I, I and it was I think two thousand nine was a recession year. Correct, yep. yeah. correct, correct. Yep. In that year, end of eight and two thousand nine, two thousand ten. I remember. Collapse so all even. the other businesses were like negative, like for likes, um, year on year sales, right? I was growing at sixteen percent that year. So wow. and that was just same store sales. We're not even growing through new restaurants. Um, and so I think it was around that time they suddenly realized, okay. Chung Lin is a person on her own. It's not Chung Lin who is, you know, the, uh, the franchisor's, franchisee's um, daughter running it on their behalf. So now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the key person working with them. So it's, it's, it's been a good journey, I've got to say. Okay, okay. So do you regret not taking the role of being the architect? Exactly. Okay, of course, I know the answer, but I want Chung Lin to sort of... Yeah. I actually... Thing. I'm, I actually have no regrets, right? Okay. <clears throat> I love this because an architect's really good in the sense that I, I, I learned all the discipline about detailing, um, form functions and all that, right? Correct. Flows and all that kind of thing. So that part really helped me in, in running a business. 
But from the business point of view in, in the restaurant industry, I love meeting people. So I think this is perfect for me. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's been so much more for me, just engaging with people, working with people, being on the ground and everything else. And I think this actually suits me more than an architect. I think an architect, the architecture thing came about. I mean, my husband was always saying to me, you know, how is it that you ended up an architect? You know, because he's an architect. We met at university. And, and, and I think it was just, I came from a construction family. I was okay. good at art. I was good at maths. And then, you know, you typical you Asian, together? typical yeah, 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 Asian, yeah, exactly, yeah. go and be an architect as a yeah. professional. Oh, so right? go and be an architect. See, that's the point, right? So you were, you were, you were nudged to be It was an architect. nudged, oh. yeah. At the same time, I, I, I think the knowledge of what you have as an architect and all is helping you quite a bit. It right? was a great, great base, honestly. Right. And I was very lucky as well. So yeah. besides, besides getting a job really fast, within two months of me being in that company, I was running my own project in London, which wow. is unheard of. I right. was 23 years old. Wow. Well, those Kit Kats paid off. <laughs> yeah, those Kit Kats paid off. And at 23 years old, I mean, I was running my own project. Okay. Um, a 16-unit um, apartment in Pimlico. So, you know, who has that kind of experience yeah. at, at that age? So it was great. Do you still have your drawings from then? Did you keep I it? do actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, end of the day, it's not. Uh, I always believe that you know whatever it's it's never a waste what you do in your early days because it always contributes to what you do uh, in various ways, right? And uh, and I I think it goes well with you as well, you know, uh, and how you 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 your thought processes in business it sure relates back to a actually lot of ways. Ac actually that's the one thing I do say. Yeah. I think it's so much better if. All kids should work for somebody else before starting mm, their own exactly. business. Yes, yes, if yes. they don't, right. they have no clue what it's like Correct. to have a boss. Yes. They have no clue what it's like to have a peer, you know. And, and also and, the going through the pressure yes. and uh, managing time and, and... Oh, managing salaries? <laughs> oh, That's yes. true. That's true. True. I mean, the, the line is, before you learn how to lead, you must learn how to follow, right? Yes, exactly. exactly. Right. Yeah, and exactly. I think, I think no, I think, Chunin, you, you, the, the reason why your story is so inspiring, I mean, before I even knew... Chunglin as a, as, a, as a personal friend and mentor to Endeavor, yeah, yeah. it's always been, you know, you read Chunglin on all these the tattlers and all that stuff. Like, wow, so cool, right? And I love Nando's. I love the brand. Yeah. And the fact that you built it literally with your bare hands, with yeah. zero experience in FMB, And then it gives the audience and you know, people can see the possibility. Yeah. Number one, again, we, we talk about being an accidental entrepreneur. And I think uh, also the passion. When you, when you are really passionate about something and, um, and and using your background and doing something different, right? And, and you rightly said earlier in the day, what do you know about chicken? You yeah. know, people were asking yeah. stuff like that, exactly. right? So you don't actually really need, end of the day, you need the passion to drive and, and do something different always. And and I think that leads to somewhere. And of course, you, you need to have that braveness to, to do that. Uh, that's what's lacking I with a lot of people. I actually think it was good that I started at 25 because yeah. I was naive. <laughs> yes. I, honestly, I think it makes a big difference, you know. If yeah. you ask me to start something now, I'm like, oh my God, where's the business plan? Yeah, where's yeah, this? Yeah, and what's yeah, the cash flow? Exactly. And what? You know, there's so yeah. many different thinking. Sometimes it's it. better when you don't know stuff and you're a bit you gung-ho. You just do it. You just do it. Yeah. Correct. If you need to adapt it, you adapt it. Yeah, so. and that, that, that's a, that's a really key takeaway here, right? So, um, you don't you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You just jump into the deep end and hope you. you yeah, we're not you, encouraging yeah. that, by the way. <laughs> but end of the day, like you know, now a lot of startups. Okay, we talk about a lot of startups now. Um, you know, uh, raising funds. This everybody's now being. Where's your businessman? What is this? What are you going to do? Your cash flow? Give me your 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 plan. Your five year plan, ten year plan, and all that. But in those days, what we have, we don't. We just go. Yeah, and, and, and it happens, yeah. and we 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 innovate. And we pivot and we keep on moving and moving and until it succeeds, right? Yeah. And I think before we end this segment, I think what's important is, Chung Lin, I think you define what Tom, our board member in Endeavour, actually said during the session we had in uh, the last couple of days. Okay. He says, smart people can hit a target no one else can hit. Geniuses hit a target no one else can see. Correct. So no one saw chicken was going to be... So Chung Lin, <laughs> clearly, yeah. maybe, maybe there's something you and your dad saw that would have created a wave of phenomenon. Because back then, it was only KFC. Yeah. And yeah. maybe... Can, was Kenny Rogers Kenny before? Kenny Rogers was Kenny before. Rogers, yeah. Before. Yeah. Yeah. before, right? So, so it was just those. And today, you know, it's, it's, you've got so many new sort of chicken-based companies came, coming up. And just, correct, you know, correct, yeah. And a lot of fright. It's very competitive. Yeah. Very, but it's becoming more competitive. Yeah. And I was, again, I was mentioning, probably we'll talk about it a bit later. You know, it's, it's now about how fast you move and how 
what are your ideas that you, you got to know to stay ahead of everyone else, right? So that's 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 the thing probably we got to go. I think, um, yeah, we have come to the end, end, of, the first end, segment, end of the first segment, right? And I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the ride. I was not too bumpy earlier. It was good, except for that one, one bump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bump. But and look, look, at, and look, look how high I am on here. <laughs> The restaurant industry is a nagging industry. It's always about just driving consistency in your restaurant, right? So you go and eat the rest of the chicken, or you comment about service or cleanliness. It's always one of <laughs> yeah. the three things that you're Correct. always focusing on. And it, and I was a bit tired, I think, at that stage. So, you know, I had my justification that I was good enough as a CEO. I've already done quite well. I built the, the business to about 50 restaurants at that point. But in order to bring it to that next level, I thought it was time that I stepped back. And that's what I did. Um, and that's when we put our first professional CEO in place. How long did it take for you to find the CEO? I can't remember. I think it was probably about a year. A year? Wow. Wow. Because I wasn't sure, right? You know, when you're stepping back for the first time, you're not quite sure what you want. And, and, and also coupled with the fact that we're a JV structure, we had to marry somebody that would be able to report into group as well as manage us as shareholders. So they always have two bosses. So, so that's something that um, it took, it took some time to understand what we wanted. I think the key one was it had to be somebody who understood culture. So the Nandas culture is a very, very key distinct part of Nandas, right? Um, so, so we're, we're a very touchy feely brand, and so we wanted somebody that could could grow people because we we have a saying that it's the people that makes the chicken. It's all about people in in Nando's. So we wanted somebody who could do that. So a people person. We wanted somebody who had managed multi chain unit. Yeah.